attendance. Um, and then we'll get started with the content. I'll play some fun music while I skin your badge so you'll be entertained. Because <laughs> y'all, this is your lunch break, right? <laughs> All right.
So this is our customer service training for 2018, and I want to start with a video. This is by Brene Brown. Does anyone read Brene Brown's stuff? She's an author. I uh, really like her stuff. In this video, she's talking about empathy versus sympathy, talking a little bit about the difference between the two. So I think you'll enjoy this, and then we'll jump right into the content. So what is empathy, and why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy fuels connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's a, it's very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions where empathy is relevant, and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. <laughs> Recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, I'm down. I know what it's like down here, and you're not alone. Sympathy is, ooh, it's bad, uh-huh. Uh, no, you want a sandwich? Uh, empathy is a choice, and it's a vulnerable choice, because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. I have it, yeah. And we do it all the time. Because you know what? Someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful, and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So, I had a miscarriage. Oh, at least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. <laughs> John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. All right, so anyone else guilty of silver lining it? I do that a lot. And you know, it comes from a good good spot, and I think from control, it probably comes from a good spot, good intent. I mean, when our patients come to see us, um, many of you all are faculty and staff when your students come in, uh, we want to make things better. You know, we, they come to us for service, and um, we want to make things better. So, you know, it comes from a good intention, but I think that there might be another way we can do it. And we want to talk today about how do we really make that sincere, genuine, and personal connection with those we serve. So the first step in that is just to thoroughly understand who it is we serve. So we want to put ourselves in their shoes. Um, we want to look at our customer groups. So this is all about customer service. So let's define those customer groups. Um, let's just do this as a big group, if you'd like. So, who do we serve? What are some of those customer groups that we serve? Say it out loud. Patients. Patients, okay. So let's describe them a little bit. What are they like? Sick. They're sick? Whiny. You got that. Whiny, okay. <laughs> Angry? Mm -hmm. Scared? Yeah, fear is probably that number one emotion that they're feeling. Frustrated. Frustrated. Yeah. Generally don't want to be with us, right? No offense to us, we're fantastic, but they don't want to be here. They don't want to be in the hospital. Yeah, so what are they looking for from us? What do they need from us? What do they expect from us? What is it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, something they can't hear themselves, right? I mean, they're at the end of the rope. They've done all the self-care they can do. They're coming to us for that. 
sometimes they do, but most of the time they want action. Yep. Action. At least do something. Yep. And oftentimes do something pretty quickly, so they're kind of in efficiency. Yep. Empathy. Information. Yeah, so they do want that information. You know, a lot of nurses, I think they got into nursing, but then all of a sudden they're putting their teacher hat on because they do have to become an educator because they're sharing that information with their patient, <coughs> oftentimes sharing it with their loved ones. And that education is so important because the loved ones are oftentimes going to be the caregivers once the patient leaves. So that education and information is so important. Good. All right, what's another customer group? Someone some students? We do have faculty and staff here. So tell me about the students. What are they like? Friendly. <laughs> Friendly. Okay. They want a sunset. Oh, yeah, so we're seeing some trends about what they want. Okay. Tired and stressed. Tired and stressed. Yeah, let's hope they don't want drugs. <laughs> Maybe a little difference there. Okay. Yeah, tired, stressed, frustrated, like, cranky. They'd like to know the information instantly without having to work too hard. Okay. Yeah. Some of them want to work really hard. But there's a bunch of them. Okay. Yeah. So they're wanting to know that relevant information pretty quickly. So again, efficiency kind of ties into what they need. All right. So we see a lot of different emotions on the emotion wheel. Um, what about family members? Y'all deal a lot with family members? I heard they're the worst. Okay. So oftentimes, you know, we, we are patient focused. And that's in our mission, but when our patients come to see us, they bring their entourage. So we then are servicing their entourage too. So oftentimes the family members, you know, we describe patients, the family members are that up a notch. Right? So that intensity is even more so because we're taking care of their loved one, the most valuable person in their life. And that's a big deal. So what do family members need from us that may be different from patients? He was in the hospital in metro area. So one thing that happened is everybody along his pathway in the in the whole service cycle were friendly. They were they had their radar out. They were looking, seeing what they could. They treated us like family. When they got ready, when he got ready to leave, first of all, the the um, the process getting him out of there was fast. The hospitalist talked to the family, and then when he went out past the desk, they were all, yay, and then all the way down to the exit door, every single person engaged him. Even though they weren't his, they weren't his medical professionals, but that made a really huge difference in his experience. Wow, that's awesome. So they were friendly, they were warm, they engaged him. They were quick. Yeah, for the outcomes. Good. So how many of y'all work at the Little Rock location, Little Rock facility? Okay. So I want to share with you um, just some data that we got from the focus groups. So we actually invited former patients back in. So they had been through their care, they had gone through the Baptist Health experience, and they came back and we asked them, you know, what went well and what do you want to see more of? Kind of, you know, give your assessment. So we did this through a focus group, lots of good discussion. And a couple of things that came out of that discussion that we saw some themes or some patterns, and those are that our patients really want to see more consistency and more communication. Not a surprise to anyone, right? We know this. We want the same thing. I mean, when it comes to consistency, we go back to places because we like the experience the first time. And when we go back the second time, we expect that that experience is going to be the same as the first time. And when it's not, that's when we get irritated, right? Because we have that level of expectation. So our patients are the same. They want that consistency and experience. They also want consistency facility to facility. So if they're transferred, they want it department to department or unit to unit. They want it shift to shift and person to person. So does anyone know how many employees we have at Baptist Health? You might want to take a guess. Mm -hmm. no. More than that now. 
Nine yes, so over 9,000. I had um, I had payroll in my group the other day. They said, 9,400. I said, well, if anyone knows, it's you. <laughs> so 9,400, um, close to 10,000 employees of Baptist Health trying to be on the same page, trying to be consistent. So that's one of the reasons why we're doing this training is to get everyone on the same page in terms of expectations for service. With communication, they just want to be kept in the loop. So they want to know what to expect, what's coming next, What's my timeline? What do I need to know, you know when I go home? So that information and that communication. So keeping them in the loop. So we really do want to make sure that we're taking a look at these two, two areas and what can we do more uh, in these areas. So oftentimes when it comes to communication, I think studies show that the average person needs to hear things seven times before they get it. So it's going to be, this is your second time here, so what, five more to go. Um, seven times before they get the information. So are we dealing with the average person when we work with patients? No. We're dealing with people that their emotions are everywhere. Their emotions are intense. They are turned up a notch. Um, they're stressed, they're fearful, they have their mind just totally bottled with what's going on. And the family members, the same. So we've got to make sure that we're over-communicating, that we're being very, very deliberate with narrating care and informing them and educating them. So big task, but it's something that they really want and really need. All right, next question. Um, if you were to describe your desired reputation, if you were to write a story for people, when they leave here, and you know they tell their story, they talk about, just like you told your story, they tell their story about the experience, what do you hope is included in that story? What do you want to be known for, either as an individual professional, what do you want to be known for as your team, as your facility, or overall that is health? What do you hope people are saying about that is health? That we're the best. Okay. That they want to go back there. Okay. They want to return. They're loyal. Okay. Good. Keep going. That we care. That we care. And they feel that they got exactly what they wanted. Mm -hmm. Got exactly what they wanted. Or what they needed. Mm -hmm. What they needed. Good outcomes. They're competent. Professional. They know what they're doing. They value me as a person. I don't know. I'm just spilling out what I would want to be known for. What else? Three more. Three more descriptors. Efficient. Efficient. <clears throat> so I wasn't there any longer than I had to be. Did you know they want to be home as soon as they get here? Yep. Two more. Knowledgeable. Knowledgeable. Sense of humor. Sense of humor. Yeah. There can certainly be a place for that in healthcare and that healing process. Good. So um, when we think about this, I think this is an interesting kind of visionary thing to do is figure out where we want to be, what do we want to be known for. And I encourage you, work towards that. Whatever it is that you want to be known for, work towards that. How do you get there? So let's take a look at our reputation according to HCAPs. Don't worry about the numbers because I know this is small. We're just going to look at the visual nature of this graph. How many of y'all like data? Okay, we got one. Three. How many of y'all love data? Okay, we still got some that are like, we're taking up that notch. So I love that when it tells a story, and this absolutely tells a story. So this is about a decade's worth of data. And this is looking at the HCAPS question about please rate your overall experience here at Baptist Health. This is a patient satisfaction survey perspective uh, that our largest customer group. So, um, or at least our most important. So when you look at this, the scale is 1 to 10, and the bars that you see on this graph are representing the top box response, which are 9s and 10s. So the percentage of 9s and 10s that we got on please rate your overall experience, to the left is about 10 or 11 years ago, and then it goes all the way up to the right being current. We are blue. That to is blue. The U.S. national average is red-orange. Sometimes it's red, sometimes it's orange. Today it looks red orange. Okay? Trend lines are there. So, what does this visually tell us? What does this tell you? What story is out there? Above average. Okay, so Baptist Health is above average. So let's go there for a moment. Hooray. We have to celebrate that for a moment. 
all right? We're doing some things very well. And we are above the U.S. average when it comes to overall experience. Looks we haven't always line. been on every single report, but trend line, we are. Okay, so we can stop and celebrate that for a moment. Okay, what else does this graph tell us? Yikes. So let's go there for a moment. The competition's catching up. The trend lines are getting closer together, right? So, you know, 10 or 11 years ago, they were pretty far apart, and now they're getting closer together. Does that stress anyone else out? How many of y'all are competitive runners? Any runners in the group? No runners in the group. Okay, maybe college runners, high school, high school. junior high, elementary track and field. Usually, if I go back that far, I'll get some 50-yard dashers. Well, let's just for a moment say that you're a competitive runner and you're in the lead. Okay, so you're running, you're in the lead, you're your first spot. You can see the, the finish line. Let's say it's a 50-yard dash. And all of a sudden, you kind of sense the competition catching up to you. You can either hear them breathe hard, you can just feel that they're there, you may look over your shoulder and see them getting closer. What do you do as a competitive runner? Are you ready? What is it? You sprint. You speed up. You figure out a way to run faster, smarter, harder to make sure you stay on top, right? So that's where we are. Um, we are in the lead, but we have to figure out a way to stay there. So we've got to do something to stay there. We've got to work smarter, harder, faster. Okay? Um, have you got watched the Winter Olympics? One more sports analogy. Okay. So I love the Olympics. I usually kind of left on to one event. This time it was the speed skating. Did any of y'all watch the speed skating? Whew. I mean, they go around those turns so fast. You know, I mean, it's like unbelievable. And they don't fall, usually. You know, not at that level. So I would watch the, you know, at the end when the gold medalists and the silver medalists, they'd, they'd come in. And it was like, the difference was like um, hundredths of a second. I mean, super close. I'm no mathematician, but super, super close. So then I would think, what did the gold medalists do differently? Because it wasn't anything big. It wasn't anything big that they did. They're all pretty comparable in terms of exceptional athletes. So what did they do differently? to stay in the lead, to get that goal. Again, that's where we're at, okay? So when you think about hospitals, the big things are pretty comparable. You know, very similar infrastructure, very similar resources, very similar technology. So what are those little things that we can do differently to stay on top? So that's what today is all about. Um, that's what this training is all about. So we want to utilize something that we already have in place and we just want to turn it up a notch. We just want to turn up the volume on something that we already have in place. No new acronyms, no new programs, no new processes. We're going to utilize the five key behaviors that we have been using for probably a decade. These are already part of our evaluation. We already have a like it scale for them. We already have an accountability <coughs> built in for them. We just want to take a look at these, get on the same page with them, and figure out ways that we can improve on them. Okay, so um, we do want to try to enhance our environment, and I, I literally use the word enhance because we're already at a place where we show compassion and we show care. And so we just want to make sure that we're doing this consistently and we're just enhancing what we do. Um, our micro objectives for today, we want to discuss the importance of each of the five key behaviors. So these are not just randomly chosen, they're important because they're critical to health care. Um, these are things that our customers look for in us. Um, we want to explain the expectations for consistency. So we want to look at where can we all be on the same page? What's that foundation in terms of consistency of where we need to be? Then we want to look at some effective practice of each behavior. We're going to do that through some case studies um, that were designed um, with feedback from our best champions. So a lot of them are very relevant to situations that happen every day. And then we want to identify ways to improve. So we're just going to Turn it up a notch on these five key behaviors. Um, I have a handout. I'm going to do a take one and pass it because I am the most inefficient pastor out of other things. So. How many of you all are aware of the five key behaviors? You kind of know what they are. Some of y'all. I'm going to help you out a little bit. So, um, Um, so we have commitment and dedication, communication, problem solving, 
in prioritizing an initiative is kind of a three in one. Um, service orientation and teamwork. They'll probably put you in the stack. Okay, so if y'all need more, let me know. So when you look at these five, these look familiar? Okay, good. So these are a part of our evaluation. They're actually 30% of our evaluation. Um, super important to help here. I mean, when you look at this, all of these are critical to what we do. Uh, we look for these things in each other. So in our coworkers and our patients, and their family members certainly look for these things in us. Uh, they all kind of have a domino effect on, on the other, which is a good thing. They link up really well. So let's take a look at the expectations for consistency. Because sometimes when we look at communication or we look at teamwork, people are like, so what do you mean by that? That's a pretty big term. So let's take a look at what goes with that so that we can understand um, just an expectation for consistency of where we want to be at. So who wants to read the bullet points under commitment and dedication? Generate enthusiasm and commitment for programs, department goals, and wishes. Yes. Demonstrate loyalty and dedication to department and management by building support for changing in direction. Seek ways to assist in making transitions smooth and smooth. Thanks, Susie. So this one has a lot to do with change, and we know that healthcare is a change of moment. So just moving through that transition of change, um, whether it's on your unit or whether it's in the overall organization, moving through that well. Um, what about communication? Who wants to read the three bullet points under communication? Speaks and writes in a clear and precise manner as it pertains to the job. Displays courtesy and respect to fellow employees, patients, and visitors. There are <coughs> care to all patients and ensures you will come Thank you so much. Without narrating here, I would argue you can go beyond just a clinical setting. Um, I think we can narrate here to each other as internal um, customers. I um, always use the example of IS. Is there anyone here from IS? information systems. So, you know, they will work with me on stuff, and, and you know I'm not technical. So they narrate care to me when they're working on, you know, software or hardware and setting up things I need. So this really goes beyond the clinical setting. All right, problem solving, prioritizing an initiative. Who wants to take those four bullets? Okay, thank you. Identify problems in work area and develop solutions. Set priorities so that work is completed in a time frame. Recognize this and act on opportunities for improvement. Confront problems quickly and enthusiastically. Great, thank you. Does anyone recognize a theme through some of these? There's like a word that keeps coming out. You got it. So enthusiasm, which looks really different for different people, um, but I really think this is just that that motivation and that want to. I think that's what we have to look for in these. Can we know when it's there? All right, what about service orientation? Who wants to take that? I would love to. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Displays enthusiasm for serving others and respecting our diversity. Demonstrates a willingness to go above and beyond the job to meet the needs of others. Demonstrates the Baptist health values adheres to code of ethical conduct, best culture, and corporate compliance policies. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right, we have one more. Who wants to take teamwork? I'll do it. Okay. Works as a team player, supporting and assisting team members, takes care of personal responsibilities and sees opportunities to assist others, and displays attitude of whatever it takes. Great. Thank you so much. So these just kind of give us a brief description of what those key behaviors entail. Um, we do have a Likert scale when it comes to our performance evaluation. So we're actually right in the time period of performance evaluations right now. So they're done in second quarter. Um, I kind of want to explain where the scale lands because um, I want us to all be on the same page with that. So I want to start with a three. Our three is the baseline. So if any employee earns a three on their evaluation on any of these key behaviors, that means that they are meeting expectations. They are working at an acceptable level within that key behavior. Not above, not below, but they are meeting expectations. So a three is not bad. A three is, is good. We're meeting expectations. 
But if we all say the three, what's going to happen to the trend line on that last graph that we look like? It's called crisscross. So the competition will catch up unless we're constantly looking for ways to improve. So a three is really baseline. Um, we actually have some key behavior standard guidelines on employee net. I don't know if you've looked at those. I encourage you to do so. But it lists some pretty specific behaviors that are associated with each of these scores. And you'll look at that column for a three, and you'll say, well, it sounds pretty good. That's because our baseline is good. We want our baseline to be good. We want the acceptable level to be good. And we want to go up from there. So a four is going above and beyond consistently. Um, looking for ways to you know, make sure that we're communicating better, have better teamwork, offering you know, to do more. So that would be a four. A five is really special recognition, and a five has a component of helping others succeed. So you're not only doing what's expected, going above and beyond, but you're really helping others by mentoring, teaching, um, coaching them in that area. Okay? So five, four, three. A two is not meeting expectations. So if anyone earns a two on an evaluation, that means they're pretty consistently not meeting the expectations. So they would get an action plan to work on to move up to at least a three. Okay? A one, I don't know if you've ever looked at the key behaviors, but like a one is just flat out not doing anything. <laughs> like sometimes I wonder why the column is on there. I look at a one, I look at the column, and like, for example, we have under communication, we've got a section on phone etiquette, and like a one is basically does not answer the phone. <laughs> and if they do answer the phone, does not transfer calls, uh, does, like, just doesn't take messages, doesn't return calls, like, just doesn't do anything. So um, that would be a one. So if a one is observ observed, hopefully it's taken care of pretty quickly to address those changes. Um, and we want to move people up to at least a what? Three. Thank you so much for not saying two. We skip the two. This two is still not meeting expectations. So we want to get them up to at least a three. Um, so that's kind of how the progression of this scale is. Um, all right. So I tell you what. We're going to do some scenarios. And I have one, one scenario per key behavior. So I need five groups. So I'm going to group you all up. You all get to just choose. If you want to come over here, if you want to go back there, whatever you want. You want to come over here? Okay. So I'm going to give you all communication. So you can stand up, you can gather around, however you can hear each other talk. Um, do you all want to work this group? And then maybe some of you all can get back over here. So I'm going to give you all teamwork. Okay. Who wants to take that? Problem solving, prioritizing, and so however you want to move up. Okay. And, um, this group back here, commitment, dedication. I'm going to switch all up because all are going to be different. I'm going to switch all up. So, three, and that's the two. So, what you're going to do is you're going to look at the scenario. There are four options. Three of them are going to, like, most of them are going to sound pretty good. They're pretty acceptable. Um, one's probably going to be the best response. D is utterly specified. So if you have a response to this scenario that is even better than anything that's on the card, by all means, please teach us. Okay, bring that up. Let us know what you came up with. Um, so these won't take you long. They're not meant to be difficult. They are meant to, to make you think about what are some of those little things that happen in the best response that make it the best response. So again, this is all about just turning it up a notch. What are those little things that you've identified that make that the best option for connecting with other people in that scenario? Okay.
Wait until your performance evaluation and see what your supervisor says about it. Yeah, let's go with that one. Being on performance boards to see what is safe to be. So you take care of it. Actively and frequently ask how your department is doing on each metric. Volunteer to communicate with the final performance board to help others see the truth Do you want the mic? No, thank you. Okay. <laughs> 
Okay. Uh, but we do explore the options with them and manage the situation in a timely manner. Either before we get off the phone or calling them back if it has ended. And we also always thank them for bringing this to our attention. And trust me, it's a great job. Good. So what verbiage would you use for solving the problem? Finding out what what the problem is. Okay. And then investigating it in our own way. Okay. So finding solutions through our own filter versus finding solutions through their filter. How are you going to get their filter? Well, we've got to find out what's wrong first. Right. Yeah. Okay. So there you've got options of what you can do. Okay. That's good. I can go with that. So this is our last model. Did you all recognize that? Listen, apologize, solve, and thank. So I really feel like the L and the A, like you get halfway through the model and all of a sudden you turn the corner through empathy. Like once you listen and you apologize, once you heard their story and you said, I am so sorry that happened, you just turn the corner. You show that empathy and that really opens it up for problem solving. You don't do that part, you miss any part of that, then you don't have that empathy there. So that's a real important part of that service orientation. Yes, we deal with angry customers all the time, either by phone or in person, maybe with angry students, I don't know. But this is something that we have to make sure that we're managing through. <coughs> Good job. All right, who wants to go next? Do we have two more? We'll go. Okay. We have problem solving, crowd solving, and initiative. Uh, question or the scenario was you're on your way to a meeting when you walk past your information room and call out and on. What do you do? What do you do? We decided not to just ignore them. Uh, but we decided that it's situational because some of us are patient here, direct patient here, and some of us aren't. So uh, we decided, for the most part, nurses and direct patient care would uh, not stop the on the patient's door, enter when it's appropriate, move through the care model, taking care of any needs uh, we can, and relay information to teammates about additional needs and then continue to the meeting. Those that were not in direct patient care would open the door, glance in, and let the patient know that they would be the nurse. Okay. Yeah. So, um, you know, I think that even people who are in non-direct patient care roles can go through the care model to a certain extent because the whole point is you want to make a connection with that person and um, so there may be some needs that you're not able to meet because first of all you're not in that role to meet them or um, you may not know so for example if they ask for water and you don't know if they can have water or not so you want to loop in someone who is knowledgeable about that so you want to loop in that expert um, but, you know, I think any of us can start that care model and make that connection with the patient to say, you know, I'm Katie, um, I work here, is there something I can help you with? And just see what they say. I think any of us can do that. Um, but then, based on the response, loop other people in. So, you know, non-clinical people, we can, we can push forward a little bit. Okay? Great job. Okay. One more group. Right? I lose count after about two, so I think this is the last one. Okay. Um, our key behavior is communication. And so it says a pharmacy tech, as a pharmacy technician, you have the unfortunate task of telling the nursing staff when certain meds are unavailable. It's not always the best news for them since they need the meds for the patient. But giving them a heads up lets them know that we're simply not withholding meds from them. It helps with everybody being on the same page. What do you say? So it says, A, we don't have the meds today. We hope they come in soon. We'll let you know. B, we don't have the meds today. I know that negatively impacts what you're doing. I'm sorry to let you know. Or C, we don't have the meds today. I know that negatively impacts patient care. I'm sorry. We placed the order 48 hours ago, and we anticipate being delivered this afternoon. I'll keep you informed and make sure you get what you need to send as it comes in. And then we also uh, added a little bit to that and thought that it would be a good idea to try to troubleshoot some other option or other alternative to get them in if it's something that's immediately necessary. Yeah. So great response here because they um, said as you explain kind of what's being done with the meds, then that will open it up for do we need to explore some alternatives? and see what else we can do. So again, problem solving, which had a direct link on the other communicators too. Great job. Um, so we've got one last scenario. This is for everyone. I'm going to talk it through and then put the text up there. Um, let's say that you're on a clinical unit and you just learned that a new patient is going to be admitted. 
Uh, or maybe you are at the college faculty staff and you have a new student coming in, or if you're in a non-clinical area, maybe you're adding to your team, so new employees coming in. So whatever the, the case is, you have someone new coming into your area. You're looking around, you're assessing the readiness of your area. So that would include um, staffing, um, the competency level of the staff, that would include supplies, resources, um, how well the staff works together, um, the accessibility of, of resources, organization of those supplies, um, the cleanliness, the um, comfort level, the hospitality being extended, you name it, everything, every aspect. You're just kind of looking around to say, are we ready? And then you realize that you're this next patient, or this next student, or this next new team member is your loved one. It's the person that you love most in life. Just think about who that person is. You don't have to say it out loud. Do you feel confident? Not just comfortable, not just mediocre, not just okay, but do you feel confident admitting them to your unit, bringing them on as a student in your class, or bringing them onto your team? Okay, so the spectrum here is absolutely yes, and this is why, or not quite yet, I need to make a few tweaks before I feel real confident, or no, I don't, and this is why. So you might land in different places on this spectrum. Um, I would like for you to just, the people around you, just kind of have a brief conversation about where you land and why. Um, because I think this is a real important question. We really try to seek to make those personal connections. If we think about, oh, that next person is our loved one, we kind of see it in a new perspective. So have this conversation just for a couple minutes. We're not going to debrief it as a whole, but I just want you to kind of put your brain there for a second, and then we'll come back. And you ask the waiter, um, how's the soup today? And he's like, 
no, do not get the soup. And you're like, what? You work here. You work here and you can't recommend your own soup? Like, do something about the soup. Take it off the menu. Change the recipe. Change it from potato to tomato. Do something about the soup. Don't just keep not recommending it. So when we know, and, and I'll tell you on the employee engagement survey, it's a five-point scale, and we have representation on all scores. We're, we're across the board. So we've got to be able to identify what is it that is making us not be able to. If we land kind of in the B, maybe with a few corrections, what are those corrections? What do we need to change so that we get to a place where we feel like, yes, I would be very confident bringing my mom to this hospital because I know that she would be well taken care of. I know that. So what do we need to do to get to that level? So I encourage you, continue thinking about this. This is just the start of a discussion. When it comes to students, working with students, continue thinking about this. What do we need to do to turn it up a notch to where we feel really confident with our most valuable person in our life coming to our place of service? What do we need to do to make it that way? Okay? Don't keep just not recommending the soup. <laughs> Change the soup. I talked to a leader the other day, and he said, so what are they saying about my soup? Great question. You know, what, what is it that we need to change? So do we not follow up with like everybody who comes through the ER as far as like satisfaction levels or their experience? How many, how many people do we follow up? Um, I have to ask, like on patient satisfaction surveys, there's probably different percentages based on facility and department that actually get the survey. And then there is a difference in survey response rate. Right. So I don't know that 100% get it. I would have to ask about about their NPR visits, and I don't think I've ever been asked. You know, how did that go? So I think if it's like a 50% sampling, then it's just very random who gets the survey. Focus group is a whole different thing because strategic development would invite different people. So it's certainly not everyone. So probably we don't follow up 100% of the time. And even if we were to send out to 100% of the patients, we will have a response rate of 100%. Yeah. Great question. Strategic development is a tighter answer on that percentage rate. I can put you connected with them. So we have one last video. It's real short. It's just words and music. So we're going to watch this, and then that will wrap it up. If I didn't see your badge, please see me after this.
Thank you all so much for being here. Have a great rest of the day.